Hi folks, welcome back. So last time we looked at probably the simplest transistor circuit that you can build, the emitter follower, and we use that as a nice buffer. This time we're gonna take that design and we're gonna just add one simple component to it that's gonna turn it from a buffer into a voltage amplifier. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take an old school Pyre VCF voltage controlled filter design that needs an amplifier at its output because its output's kind of quiet. And we're gonna design a transistor amplifier for the output of that circuit. Why don't we go and have a look on the breadboard and see how this circuit works. So if we have a look at this on the oscilloscope, okay, so there's our signal and you can see it there on the scope. So as I apply this control voltage, it basically applies more filtering. Okay, so this is the schematic for that circuit I just built up on the breadboard. So this is where we start with one caveat that makes this circuit a little bit strange, which is that the audio input can't be higher than about a volt. Okay, and that's because of this filtering stage. So we come through this filtering stage and we see that the control voltage, that's what CV means for the filter, is applied to the anodes of these two diodes. With the other leg of each diode essentially being connected to ground. So we've got two diodes in series, but the cathode of the pair of diodes is connected to ground. Remember from my diodes video, check it out if you've not seen it, a diode is switched off when the anode is less than 0.6 volts more positive than the cathode. So with no audio input, this is zero volts, this is zero volts. So these are switched off and that makes them look like an open circuit, like an open switch. And then as we apply this control voltage, we'll go from an open circuit through a variable resistance to a short circuit when they're fully on. These capacitor and resistor pairs, we've seen this before, this is just an ordinary low pass filter. There's a low pass filter here and a low pass filter here. Check out my circuits 101 video if you want to see more, but we calculate the um, center frequency of a low pass filter with this equation. And because we've got two, essentially what that means is it's got the same center frequency, but it just rolls off quicker. Awesome. So this is why we need the input signal to be less than about a volt, because these need 1.2 volts to turn on. So if we apply a nine volt, say, audio signal in here, then that's just gonna switch on these diodes and the filter will just be stuck fully on all the time and we won't be able to do anything with our control voltage. We wanna be able to affect how much filtering is going on with this control voltage. That's the whole point of this circuit. So we're gonna to have to attenuate our audio signal so that it doesn't go above about a volt. And then that's what this section here is for. This is just a transistor amplifier so that we wanna boost the voltage back up to the same level it was at before. Let's just assume we've got a plus minus one volt signal coming in because that's what I'm gonna use in this video. So you may look at this and think that this looks very similar to what we did last time, and that's because it is. The big difference here is that now we have a resistor here connected to the collector. We call this a collector resistor or a load resistor, and then we're taking the output below that collector resistor or load resistor. So I'm gonna run through it very quickly, but if you get lost, it might be worth going and watching my last video where I go over these steps in a lot more detail. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna pick our operating point, we call it. So we're gonna pick this voltage, that's gonna set this voltage, and then we can set this resistor to set this current, okay? Um, so we're gonna set this point to be 1.6 volts, and then if we assume VBE to be about 0.6, that's gonna set this point here to be one volt. And then if I set this resistor here to be 1K, and then that will give me a current through here of one volts divided by 1K, which we'll call IE, and that will be about one milliamp. So this is a little different from last time. Last time we wanted to center the output which we were taking from the emitter. So we set this bias voltage so that the bias voltage minus VBE would center the output. This time we're not doing that. We want this point nice and low so that we can, because we can only swing from nine volts, uh, well a bit below nine volts to a bit above this emitter voltage, right? So this gives us eight volts of swing. So then we've got this emitter current, which is one milliamp, and we can approximate that because the base current is very small, um, that the collector current is approximately equal to the emitter current. So if I pick this resistor here to center the output in the range that I have, I've got about eight volt swing. So I'll set this to be 3.9K, which is the nearest preferred value to 4K. With no input signal applied, I'll have one milliamp times 3.9K dropped across this resistor. That'd be about four volts. So then we'll have nine volts minus four volts will be five volts. And then five volts sits nicely halfway between one volts and nine volts. So how does this work as an amplifier then? So if we have a 
changing signal coming in here, that'll be capacitively coupled onto this bias network. And so we know that any change in this bias signal will appear here, exactly the same, because this point here is always 0.6 volts below here. So if this goes to 1.7 volts, this will go up to 1.1 volts. So they're not the same voltage, but any changes in voltage look the same here as they do here. If this goes up and down by 0.1, this goes up and down by 0.1. And if this point goes up by, let's say, 0.1, then that means that we now have 1.1 volts across 1K, which means we have 1.1 milliamps. And now this 1.1 milliamps, because these two currents are approximately the same, will flow through this resistor, but this resistor is four times bigger than this one. So we have a gain of four, one well, minus four in fact, because as the current increases through this resistor, because we're taking the output beneath this resistor, the output here will drop, right? So if this voltage here goes up by 0.1, this voltage here will go down by 0.4. Remember we picked this ratio for these resistors, but we haven't picked the actual resistors themselves. So to divide this down, I'm just gonna put 47K here and 10K here. What we're doing is we're working backwards. We've thought about the bias point to set this point here. We wanted one milliamp, so we picked this resistor to give us that one milliamp, and then we know that this times 100 is what the transistor looks like. So the transistor input looks like 100K, so this has to be 10K or less, because it has to be 10 times less than whatever it drives. And so the parallel combination of these is about 9K. So yeah, I almost forgot to mention this. These are all 47K. And these are all, I think, five nanofarads. Okay, let's go and have a look at it working. Here's that circuit that we built up. So this is our filter section that I walked you through. This is the transistor amplifier. So there's our bias network. This is the emitter resistor, and this is that collector resistor, 1K and 4K, 3.9K. And this is 10K and 47K. Here's the output of our filter capacitively coupled into it. And so we're looking at the voltage on the base, and we're looking at the voltage at the collector. And if we have a look on the oscilloscope, we can see there how we've got that quite nicely. So, so this half a volt increase at the base causes the voltage across this emitter resistor to go up by half a volt. That increases the current through the emitter resistor, which increases the current through the collector resistor. And because these two currents are the same, but this resistor is four times bigger, that means that the voltage drop across this resistor is four times bigger. So if that was half a volt, that would be two volts. And so we can see here, this goes up by what half a volt and this goes down by two volts. Obviously this is actually slightly less than 4K, so it's actually slightly less than two volts. And so that's all good. So we've got this working, this amplifier working beautifully. It all looks great until we look at the input to the filter as the yellow signal and that blue signal is the output of the amplifier. And we see that the output of the filter is higher than the output of our amplifier what is going on here something horrible has gone wrong and what thing has gone horribly wrong is that if i remove this decoupling capacitor aka if i remove the amplifier from the circuit that's with it out that's with it in that's with it out so the transistor is loading down the output of the filter and quite a lot you can see so this is very bad and this is because the worst case output impedance for this is about 140k 150k but we know we've got 1K here, so 1K times 100, so the input of the capacitor looks like about 100K, so we might expect some attenuation. So even that wouldn't be good enough, for starters. On top of that is that this bias network parallels the input impedance, doesn't it? So we've got this 100K input impedance, and then we've got this bias network, which is 10K in parallel with 47K, which looks like about 8.5K or so in parallel with that, and so that's going to dominate the input impedance. So the input impedance is just going to look like this bias divider. So we're essentially trying to drive 8.5k with 150k. That's not going to happen, <laughs> and that is why we're seeing this attenuation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go downstairs and we're going to have a look at how can we try and increase the input impedance for this. Okay, so we need to increase the input impedance of this transistor amplifier somehow, and what we're going to try first is this thing called bootstrapping. So how we're going to use bootstrapping today, there's different ways you can use bootstrapping, but in this context we're going to use some positive feedback from the output of the amplifier. It, so what that means is we're going to feed some of the output of the amplifier in phase back to the input, and what that's going to do is increase the input impedance of the amplifier. And let me explain to you how that's going to work. 
So basically what we've been doing until now with these transistor circuits is we've had this DC biasing circuit and then we've had the AC signal superimposed on top of that DC bias. So essentially the DC bias and the AC network has been kind of the same thing. But what we're going to do with this bootstrapping is we're going to have one network to do the DC biasing and a different network completely that does the AC circuitry, okay? The first thing we do is I'm going to detach this biasing network from the base of the transistor. So this is going to be our DC bias. Remember, whatever we see here times 100 is what we're driving. That's what the transistor looks like. So this needs to be 10 times less than that. So if this looks like 100K looking into the base of this transistor, watch my last video if you don't know what I'm talking about here, then we need this DC bias circuit that we're about to build to look like 10K or less. So at the moment, this looks like 10K and we were just connecting it in parallel. What we can do now is because we've disconnected this, we can do things slightly differently. So I'm gonna divide both these resistors by 10. So now this is 1K and this is 4.7K. So I've also divided the impedance by 10. So if these in parallel before looked like about 9K, it's about 8.6K or something like that. Now they look like about 0.9K, but the ratio of the two resistors is still the same. So if we took the voltage at this point, this voltage is still 1.6 volts. But what we want is for the impedance at the base to look the same as it did before, however we had it set up. So what we can do then is add a resistor in series from the output of this voltage divider to the base of the transistor. And this is just like a top up resistor. So if we've reduced this parallel impedance from 47K in parallel with 10K, which is about eight and a half K, I can't remember exactly what it was, down to about 850 ohms. And so then we've got 850 ohms in series with 7.5 kilo ohms. So the base sees 8.3K. Yeah, and so the 47K in parallel with 10K was 8.25K, now it sees 8.3K. So what we can see now is that we've changed this arrangement, we've divided these down by a factor of 10, and that's kept the ratio the same, so we've got the same voltage, and it's allowed us to put this 7.5K resistor here, so that the base now sees the same impedance at DC, but now we see something very different at AC. We feed the input signal in like this, and we will see any changes that we put in here, down here. We know this already, so let's say we put 0.5 volts in here. So what we're doing here is we've got this 1.6 volts here, that's in series with the base. So the base is biased to be 1.6 volts. Then this is gonna go up to 2.1. So we'd have a half a volt voltage drop across this resistor, so we get a current. So now that we've increased this by 0.5, so this voltage goes up to 2.1 minus 0.6, which is 1.5. So if we feed some of this signal back with a capacitor like this, go and check out, I've got a whole series on capacitors if you don't know the ins and outs of capacitors. The golden rule to remember with capacitors when you're talking about changing signals, the voltage across a capacitor will remain constant. When you apply a changing signal, remember, let's rewind back to before we applied our input signal. So this side of the capacitor was at 1.6 volts, this side of the capacitor was at one volt. Then when we apply this signal, and this side goes up by half a volt to 1.5 volts, because we had this 0.6 volts across the capacitor, if we raise one side of the capacitor, the capacitor has to maintain this 0.6 volt difference that it had before. So for that to happen, this voltage here has to go up to 2.1 volts. So now we can see that there's no voltage drop across this resistor because this side is 2.1 and this side is 2.1. Why is that important? Well, that's important because remember how we defined input impedance a few videos ago was the input impedance for, your, for an AC signal if we make a change in voltage and we measure the change in current caused by that changing voltage, then that is our input impedance. And so if we've applied a half a volt signal and we've had no change in current, then mathematicians look away, we've got an infinitely large input impedance. Hopefully the fact that I've just said that we've got an infinitely large input impedance has set a red flag off in your brain. 
We can't have an infinitely large input impedance. There's one tiny trap. So the reality is, is that the emitter of the transistor has a very small resistance associated with it. So we can model the output of the emitter as having a tiny, teeny, tiny. It's dependent on the collector current. We'll go into it in more detail in another video. And we call it RE prime. 0.5 volts that we see at the input goes out of the emitter and then it goes through this voltage divider. You see here with this RE prime and this is RE. And so at one milliamp, this RE prime looks like about 25 ohms. That's why we can usually ignore it because it's usually quite small. 25 ohms in a voltage divider with 1K, you know, we can usually ignore that because it's below our 10% threshold. So we can usually ignore it, but very small is not nothing. So this will make a difference. So now when this goes up to 2.1, so we go up to 2.1, that means we get 1.5 here. That goes through this voltage divider. We've got a voltage divider made of RE prime and RE. Wrong. Remember, this is a short circuit. So this is short circuited because we're talking about AC signals here. The power supply is a short circuit as well. So we've got our 1.5 volts in a voltage divider with RE in parallel with this 1K resistor in parallel with this 4.7K resistor. So this would be like a, I think I use like a 100 microfarad capacitor here. Nice big capacitor. And so that's why you usually see these resistors. So they were 47K and 10K. You usually see people halve these resistors um, and then top it up with this resistor. I divided them by 10 so I could have as big a resistor here as possible, but I had to be mindful so these two in parallel are about 850 ohms. So that would parallel this. So that basically makes this voltage divider worse, but we're still better off doing that and having this bigger resistor in terms of the final input impedance than if I just divided these by two and done that. Maybe you try that out on a piece of paper at home and prove to yourself that that is true. So we've got a voltage divider with 25 ohms and this whole thing here looks like about 450 ohms. So this should have been 0.5. I wrote 1.5 by accident, because remember, it's only the AC signals that go across this capacitor. So for the DC signals, it sees a different voltage divider. Everything is completely different. And those two things are kind of superimposed on top of each other. I know that's kind of complicated at first, but so if we put 0.5 volts into this voltage divider, we get about 0.47 volts out, okay? And so then that gets added on to our one volt that sat here before to 1.47 here. And so now this side goes up by 0.47 volts instead of 0.5 volts. So this will be 2.07. So now what the current through this resistor is going to be four microamps. And so that's why I divided these by 10 so I could get the biggest resistor here possible. So our AC input impedance, 125K input impedance. So we've improved our input impedance from about 8K to about 125K. That's about 15 times better, which is great. That's a pretty good input impedance. I'd be happy with that for most circuits, 100K. So let's go upstairs and have a look and see how it works out in reality. Okay, so we're back upstairs. So we're still getting some attenuation here. So it's not ideal, but it's much, much better. And now if we compare the input to the output, we've got a one volt peak in and now we're getting just over two volts peak out. We need to do one of two things really. We need to either improve the gain of the amplifier and accept that we're gonna have some loading because of this particularly tricky source, or we can improve the input impedance further with some other techniques. This is why I picked this circuit is because I wanted something really tricky. So we really have to go through a couple of different circuits and really um, we'll come out of it knowing a lot about transistors. Maybe as homework or something, you can go over adding my transistor buffer before this stage and improving the input impedance further. What we're going to look at over the next couple of videos, we're going to look at high gain amplifier circuits and the limitations and drawbacks of those types of circuits. And then we're going to go on to look at negative feedback, which is feeding the output out of phase back into the input. And that has lots of benefits of its own. So that's a topic of its own. We'll go into that in future videos. Thanks for watching. If you do want to see me going through that design, but with the buffer instead, I've uploaded a bonus video to my Patreon. There's some other bonus videos on there of me designing stuff. If you're interested in that, please check that out. If not, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to come back next time. Like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, all that stuff. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.